Thank you for coming out. I know it's game night, uh, and I know that um, this is a relatively specific talk on a disease uh, that's near and dear to my heart, and I hope to educate you about it so you can educate your friends and your family. Um, I know that there will be some questions from the audience, probably not specifically pertaining to this exact topic, maybe on heart health or something like that, and so I'll keep this talk relatively brief, probably about 40 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, I do have some disclosures. I'm a volunteer, and I volunteer as the chief medical officer for a patient-led charity for individuals with this particular form of heart disease that I'm going to be talking about. It's called the FH Foundation. And the more you click on our website, the better we like it. So uh, go to our website and check it out. I have received grant support from um, many places. Um, I'm going to give you a pre-talk quiz, and we'll see how you do pre- and post-talk to see how I've done. How common is F, so you guys got pens, you, many of you got pens. So how common is FH in the general population? Is, does it happen to one in 1,000 of us, one in 500, or one in 200? So just think about your answer. How many say, how many say one in 1,000? How many say one in 500? All right, how many say one in 200? Okay, so everybody will know. How, how FH patients are at what fold increased risk of a heart attack? How many say five? Familial hypercholesterolemia, FH. Familial hypercholesterolemia. So that's, you don't know about that yet, but by the end you will know about that. Uh, what is cascade screening? What is the goal LDL cholesterol? And what are the three genes that are caused to have mutations? And so many of you will not know, probably most of you will not know the answers to any of these questions. And by the end, I hope you'll know the answers to these questions. And not only will you know the answers to these questions, you'll know the answers to what these questions mean because probably many of you don't even know what some of these things are. So well, I always like to start with a case because cases, this is one of our patients at Stanford. It's a 45-year-old male. He didn't have any problems as a child. At 26, he was told that his cholesterol level was 350 and that uh, he needed to be on medications for that. And then for about 10 years, he didn't have any problems. But then he started having chest pain when he worked out in the gym. And he went to his doctor, and they said, well, you need a stress test. And so he did that, and that, said that, that was not a good news for him. His stress test was positive. And so then he had an angiogram. A, a, they took pictures of his coronary arteries, and they said, you know, you need a bypass surgery. Your arteries are all blocked. And uh, the next day, he had a bypass surgery. So it was shocking. He was 40, 40, 40 in his early 40s at the time. And then he had to have surgery on his carotid arteries that lead to his brain. And uh, he, he, uh, is, this is unfortunately is not atypical for FH patients. FH patients, as you'll learn, have extremely elevated cholesterol levels that places them at hugely increased risk of heart disease. And so uh, he's on lots of medications now to control his cholesterol. He's on four medications to control his cholesterol. He's on medications to prevent heart attacks. And uh, if I can leave you with only one message going forward, it's that FH, the most important th thing that we say is we don't ever find individuals with FH. We only find families with FH. Because if you look with his family, here he is over here. He had a bypass surgery. It turns out his wife also had FH. She didn't know, she didn't know it at the time. And all three of their children have FH. And so uh, in medicine, in America, we, f we forget about the family a lot of times. And uh, that's something that we need to keep in mind. So what is FH? We call it familial hypercholesterolemia, family high cholesterol. So we say FH because it's hard to say that. So just remember that term, FH. Now we know that heart disease is the leading cause of death in the world, and it's certainly the leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, heart disease, I mean mostly blockage of the arteries that feed the heart. And we know that over the last... 10 years, we've done a good job. We've done a good job in lowering heart disease in older individuals, older than 65. But in younger individuals, we haven't done such a good job. And part of the reason for this is that we're not identifying these young people that have particular problems that make them at hugely increased risk of heart, heart disease. Now, how common is FH? None of you, how many of you had heard of FH before I started this talk? One, one, because you've done some articles on it. Now, how many of you have heard of cystic fibrosis? Okay. How many of you have heard of Marfan syndrome? How many of you have heard of multiple sclerosis? Okay. So everybody's heard of Marfan syndrome, uh, 
Marfan syndrome, multiple sclerosis, cystic fibrosis. FH is orders of magnitude more common than those conditions, but none of you have heard about it, and so that's a big problem. And not only have none of you have heard about it, but in the United States, we estimate that only 1% of the people in the country that have FH know they have FH. And so if you don't know you have something, you can't treat it. And so that's also a big problem, and that's one of the reasons that I give these kind of talks to try to get the word out. Now, the irony of this is that if, we, if all these patients knew about it and they treated it, we could get rid of their risk, their excess risk of heart disease. They basically would go back to being just like the general population. If we start treatment, this is a, this is a, this, this is a graph that shows years and chances of uh, uh, event-free survival. And so basically, if you have a statin, if you're putting, if you take an FH patient and you put them on a drug to control their cholesterol, they live a long, healthy, normal life. If you don't find an FH patient and put them on cholesterol-lowering medications, they have heart attacks and they die early. Is everybody following me so far? So it's imperative that we identify these people early. In the old days, before we had statin controlling medications, medications to control cholesterol, if you had FH and you weren't treated and you were a man, there was a 50% chance you'd have a heart attack by the time you were 50. And so that is a huge increased risk, more than 20-fold increased risk versus the general population. And the other problem about that is it causes 12,000 heart attacks a year in the United States. And how many know what it costs to care for a person? If you, if you have a heart attack and they take you to Stanford, how much does it cost to put a stent in and, and care for you in the hospital just for that immediate hospitalization? Anybody have any idea? Just throw some numbers out. Not, not 100000 not even 50000 It's probably about $25,000 just for the immediate hospitalization. So if you imagine that if this is causing 12,000 heart attacks a year, the immediate health care costs for all of us are huge. So how does this present, and why is FH such a problem, and how does it just different than, than regular high cholesterol? So most of us were born, and when we're born, we have very low cholesterol levels. Our LDL, or bad cholesterol levels, are about 50 milligrams per deciliter. And over time, because we eat a bad diet and we don't exercise much, over time our cholesterol levels gradually rise. And that's not the case in FH. In FH, you're born with very, very high cholesterol levels, and those cholesterol levels go even higher as we age. And so they have a cumulative effect of a lifelong exposure to very high cholesterol levels, and that's what puts them at heart disease risk. And so that would, that's what this graph represents. How, how much cholesterol they've had for how many years and so individuals without FH, they have a gradual increase in their cholesterol, and they start to develop heart disease in their 50s, 60s. If you have FH, you start to develop heart disease in your 30s. And if you're unlucky enough that you inherit a mutation, an FH mutation from mom and from dad, instead of your cholesterol levels being double or triple normal, they're 10 times normal. And those people have, those kids, they're very, very rare, happens very rare, but those kids often have to have bypass surgery in their teenage years. So when I say the cholesterol levels are very different, what does that mean? Well, an average cholesterol level for an FH patient might be 250 or 290 milligrams per deciliter. An average patient, if you don't have FH in this room, your, your LDL cholesterol might average about 130 to 150. So hugely increased, this is the curve. You know, some FH patients are a little less affected than others. But in general, there's a huge difference in the cholesterol levels between FH patients and non-FH patients. People following me so far? Okay. So how do we diagnose FH? Well, it turns out that one of the most important things is how high is your cholesterol. It's also important to know what your family history is. Has, has there been a family history of early heart disease? How high is the history of, uh, 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 how high is the cholesterol in the family? There's also physical exam findings that people with FH get. They get, they get cholesterol deposits in their tendons that we can see. They get cholesterol deposits around their eyes that we can see. They get, they get little, uh, this is called arcus, they get discolorations of the iris. And um, if we look at all these and we look at the cholesterol, we can make a pretty fair uh, statement about whether a person has FH or not, or we can simply plug it into an app. There are apps now that allow us to calculate this. And, um, and that's, it's very important. Now, what causes FH? Why are there some people around? Why are there, uh, you know, people around that are walking around with these astronomically high cholesterol levels? 
And this is a genetic condition. And a genetic condition means it's passed in families from parent to child, from parent to offspring. And how many genes do we have? How many genes are in the human genome? 5,000, 10,000, or 20,000? Who says 5,000? Who says 10,000? Who says 20,000? Okay, 20,000. There's about 20,000 genes in the human genome. That controls what I look like, what you look like, how we all, uh, how we all are, 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 are built. In FH, individuals have a single gene that's mutated. And those single gene that's mutated are genes that are mostly active in the liver. This is a rep to meant to represent a liver cell. This is the blood up here. This is the liver cell here. This is the membrane of the liver. And your liver is, has a recycling program in it. The recycling program it has is for cholesterol. And so normally the liver makes cholesterol, but it also recycles, recycles cholesterol. And LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, floats around in the bloodstream. And it's a recyclable. It's actually basically waste. And so your liver likes to take up that waste and actually put it into your GI tract and you, and you poop it out. But in FH, the liver has a mutations in these receptors that normally bind to these cholesterol particles. And so you cannot pull cholesterol from the blood and get rid of it, recycle it. Instead, the cholesterol levels remain very high in the, in the blood. Is everybody following that so far? Now, you, in FH, you can either have a mutation in the gene that, that binds to the cholesterol, the protein that binds to the cholesterol. You can have a mutation in the protein that um, binds to the receptor. And it also turns out you can have a mutation in the gene here that helps to degrade this receptor. So if you have a, if this, if this gene here is overactive and it degrades this LDL receptor so this is not there anymore, again, the LDL levels can remain very high in the blood. So it's a genetic disease. If one individual in a family, if a parent has it, every child that they have has a 50% chance of having it and, and further on down the line. So it's very, it's transmitted in families very strongly. And um, that has been, you know, it, it, having, being a genetic disease has its pluses and minuses. The pluses, the, uh, the, the minuses are, are obviously that you can have lots of people in the family suffer consequences, but the pluses are that it can make it easier potentially to find it if you look for it. And so in, in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, they've made FH a national priority they realized that this was a big healthcare burden. And they have a program where if they find one individual in a family with FH, they actually send public health nurses to that person's house. And they take a blood sample, and they, they confirm that they have high cholesterol. And they also take a blood sample, and they, they use that for a DNA test. And if they find the DNA mutation in that individual, then they can use that DNA mutation to screen all of the rest of the family members for that DNA mutation. Okay. And so uh, they started with 5,000. Over, over about 30 years, they accumulated about 5,000 individuals that had FH. And they screened 60,000 family members. That's brothers, sisters, parents, et cetera. And they, if, it's, if, it, if, it, if we forecast that FH would affect one in two, how many of 60,000 would we have expected to find? Half, 30,000. They didn't find 30,000. They found 27,000. What happened to the other 3,000? They might have, maybe they died or something like that. Now, it turns out that using this genetic testing improves the ability to find FH patients. And so it, it turns out that it's incredibly cost effective to find uh, FH patients and treat them because the medications that we use generally are pennies a day and you're preventing big heart attacks at an early age. So the cost effectiveness per year of life saved is, was about 8,000 euros. And who knows in the United States what we judge in general cost effectiveness to, to, to be. How much is the United States in general willing to spend on treatments per year of life saved? $5,000, $50,000, or $500,000? It's $50,000. In general, the, the standard for uh, what we're willing to spend per year of life saved for an individual is about $50,000, and that's based on the cost of dialysis per year. Medicare pays for dialysis. It costs about $50,000 per year per patient. Highly cost effective. And it also turns out that when you give people genetic information, it might actually improve outcomes. And the reason for that is not very clear, but there's this idea that maybe people respond to genetic information differently. So in the Netherlands, they did this study where they said, 
They took individuals and said, you have FH. You know, you have an LDL cholesterol of 300. You've got a family history of heart disease. You need to be on cholesterol-lowering medications. And they took another group of patients, and they said, you have FH. You've got an LDL cholesterol of 300. You've got a family history of heart disease. You need to be on a cholesterol-lowering medications. And by the way, we've done a genetic test that proves you have FH. And it turns out that the people that had the genetic information over time had lower cholesterol levels. Now, is that because it motivated them? Is that because it motivated their physician? We don't know. But it, it certainly helped uh, control their disease. And for this reason, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, has said we need to be paying much more attention to FH. It's a genetic condition with a high societal cost. And they've actually looked through all the genetic conditions that affect individuals in the US, and they've ranked three diseases as tier, one, as tier one indications for use of genetic information. And who might guess? I'm telling you one of them is, is familial hypercholesterolemia, FH. The others are things that are probably much more familiar to you. Hereditary breast cancer, like Angelina Jolie, uh, and hereditary colon cancer. So everybody's heard of breast cancer. Everybody has family members that have had a history of breast cancer. Many people have had family members with colon cancer. And a disease that has similar burden is, is FH, but nobody's heard about it. And so we're now doing a trial where we're taking people. This, this foundation I work with is, is working with a group in Pennsylvania. And they're doing this trial in the United States where they're saying, you have, you have high cholesterol. It's important to get your relatives checked, to tell your relatives to get their cholesterol checked. And then we're taking other individuals and say, you have high cholesterol and you have a particular genetic mutation. That means that you really need to get your relatives checked. And we're going to see if it motivates people to get their relatives screened. Is that following me so far? OK. So how do we treat FH patients? Well, I mean, the first thing that we all do is we say you need to eat a healthy diet and you need to exercise regularly. And um, the most important thing about lowering your cholesterol in terms of the diet is reducing saturated fat. So that's processed foods. That's uh, you know McDonald's. That's fast food. That's, uh, that's um, pastries, et cetera. High fiber. Referral to a dietitian, and then we get people on medications, statins, and those those statins are drugs like Lipitor and Zocor and uh, Mevacor and Crestor. Those are the mainstays of therapy. But most FH patients will require more than one medication to lower their cholesterol, and that's a big difference than most people. Most people that have high cholesterol can do with one medications. FH patients always use more than need more than one. We always need to consider FH patients at very high risk. One of the big things that we have to deal with is patients not wanting to take medications. And we have to convince them that if they don't take medications, their chances of having bad problems are very high. And so um, we, don't, we don't treat FH patients like a garden variety high cholesterol patient. We also always use uh, statins and non-statin drugs. And, and the important information that we give them is that if we get you on therapy and we get you on therapy early enough, your risk of heart disease dramatically decreases. This is another figure, I've shown you this earlier, where they took individuals with FH. This was in the Netherlands. Statins, these statin drugs didn't come out in the Netherlands until 1990. And, it, and what they did then is they said they had 2,400 patients with high FH. And uh, they, they, they started with 2,100. And then they um, randomized, or not randomized them. They looked at the ones that ended up taking statins versus the ones that didn't take statins. And if you had FH and you took statins, your morbidity and mortality was very good. And if you didn't take statins, by 10 years later, you know, 25% had died. It also turns out that you know, the FH doesn't just affect adults, obviously. It affects children. And uh, it turns out that um, when kids have high enough cholesterol, there's a good rationale for treating them with medications as well. The, the cholesterol has to be very high. But in, in, the, in the Netherlands, they've also done studies where they've taken FH kids and when they started, this is their, you know, in their teenage years or earlier, their cholesterol, 237 already, compared to their siblings that didn't have FH. So their cholesterol is already double normal. And then they put them on medications. And 10 years later, they looked. And the, the, uh, the normal kids, everybody's cholesterol goes up as we age. So they went from 100 to 124. And the kids on statins went from 237 to 173. And it turns out that their measure of the plaque, their atherosclerotic buildup, also normalized. So getting kids on medications early can save, potentially save lives down the line. Now, one of the big problems with FH is that 
We'd like to get people to have cholesterol levels that are optimal. And optimal cholesterol levels, LDL cholesterol levels, are less than 100. Everybody defines that. Most people don't have cholesterol levels that are optimal, but we'd like to get FH patients to an optimal level to compensate for that past burden. But only 20% of FH patients, even with all the medications we can use, ever get there. And only 40% of patients ever get to an LDL of 130. So this is a big problem. They can also develop muscle toxicity to statins. Uh, about 10 or 15% have that problem. And so uh, there's been a, this urgent need for new medications. And I don't know, uh, very serendipitously for this talk, I guess, um, how many of you have heard this story about these new cholesterol-lowering medications that have gotten a lot of press in the last two days? The FDA basically had hearings, and the committees recommended the approval of two new medications for high cholesterol. Ha had any, any of you see that press? It was, a, it was in the New York Times. It was in the Washington Post. It was in PBS, et cetera. And uh, here is the founder of the FH Foundation. This is a woman that I've been working with for three years. She has FH. Her daughter has FH. She had a heart attack in her 30s, and she founded this charitable organization. And uh, these are the, some of the uh, CEOs of these companies that have these new cholesterol drugs. This is an article in the New York Times that came out, and, and they, they, they were nice enough to quote me in that article because I think that uh, these medications are potentially game changers for FH. And these drugs are called P... I'm not going to ask you to remember this. You'll never remember this, but these drugs are called PCSK9 inhibitors. And... Uh, and they're a poster child, and, and the quote that I had about these drugs is they're a triumph of the modern genetic revolution. So this is your tax dollars at work helping to discover these, these drugs. So how did this happen? Well, about simultaneously, families in France were found to have mutations in PCSK9 that caused this enzyme to be overactive. And again, when this gene is overactive, it degrades LDL receptors, and the cholesterol levels remain very elevated in the blood. So overactive PCSK9 is bad. About the same time, in studies that were helped to be f funded by a, a charity but also by the, by the NIH, individuals in Texas were found to have naturally occurring mutations. That means they were born with these natural mutations. They caused an inactive PCSK9. And these inactive PCSK9 folks have extremely low LDL cholesterol. They're born with low cholesterol, and they are, remain with low cholesterol their whole life. Their PCSK9 does not work, and uh, their cholesterol levels are much lower than the normal people. You know, the average cholesterol was about 70. Here, the average cholesterol is about 130. But their risk for heart disease, those people that had the mutation, was, was 90% gone. So they had a 90% reduction in their risk of heart disease. And you could never tell that these individuals had a problem. Their LDL cholesterol levels were very low, and their only side effect seemed to be they lived a long time and they didn't have heart disease. So the, these drug companies are not dumb and they said, well, this sounds like a good target. We're going to develop drugs to treat this, this uh, condition and we're going to develop inhibitors of this enzyme. And they have, and they're, uh, they're, these are antibodies, they're injectable drugs. And if you inject them once every two weeks or once every month, these are plots of cholesterol <laughs> levels. So here are cholesterol levels uh, in FH patients. These are FH patients. Normal, these are FH patients that did not get the active drug. Their cholesterol level over time remained about 182, their LDL cholesterol. If they did get the active drug, look, there's a dramatic drop in their LDL cholesterol, and that remained for, for over a year. And so the FDA has weighed the evidence and said uh, for certain populations, it looks like these drugs are going to be very promising. They haven't uh, conclusively demonstrated that they increase lifespan or reduce heart attacks, but those studies will come out in the next couple of years. So, so that's the landscape, and, and there remain a lot of challenges for FH, and I'm just going to talk to you about a few of them that we're helping to address at Stanford and how we're doing it. So what are the problems? Well, lack of public awareness. Nobody here knew what it was. Underestimate of how serious it is. There was no active registry. There's no specific ICD-9 diagnostic code, so you're, I can't go to a, the healthcare system and say, pull out all the people that have a, a code for FH. And, it, and we have a fractured healthcare system. You know, one family member gets care one place, one family member gets another. And so for tackling family diseases, it's hard. And so the FH Foundation, I work with them, we're trying to address these. We have trained a lot of FH patients. These are all FH patients that are being trained to go into the community and educate people. 
We've applied for a specific code that doctors can use to code an FH patient in the medical record. We've started a national registry, and, and, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is this project what we're doing, a big data project um, um, that has gotten um, some awareness here. So we're trying to increase awareness through social media. We have a website that gets 10,000 hits a month. And um, again, all of these are FH patients. They're, being, they're, they're all passionate about getting the word out to prevent uh, future problems. We have a national summit that we host every year. So what, what are we starting to learn from our patients that are participating in research. And, uh, and this is a new trend in, in the United States. It's patient participation in research, patient participation in care, patient autonomy, patients driving uh, improved outcomes. And so these are, the, these are representative, these uh, blue ones are representative of clinics where patients are being enrolled to participate in our registry. At Stanford, we have about 100 patients that have enrolled. At University of Pennsylvania, they have about 350 patients, et cetera. And we're starting to learn some really interesting things about the, the, the average age of these FH patients is about 55, but the average age of diagnosis is about 45. So they've gone 45 years without knowing they have something that's potentially deadly. By the time they get to the registry, if you count it all up, about 35% have already had a heart attack or a stroke or a bypass surgery. And the average cholesterol level is about 250 in these, in these pokes, and they, again, are not getting to healthy levels even with currently available drugs, despite the fact that at least uh, it, uh, about 55% uh, of them are taking more than one cholesterol-lowering medication. The other... I notice the charts have, uh, they always show the LDL. Do they ever talk about how their HDL looks in this... Prototype? No, so you know, HDL is a, a new, um, it, there's a lot of controversy about HDL, and uh, it turns out that it's not nearly as important as we once thought it was, and, uh, and really LDL is the driver. HDL is a marker of good overall health, good diet, good exercise, but it turns out that treating people with drugs to raise HDL levels is not effective, and, and so FH patients have HDL levels that are just like the general population. Now, it also turns out that even at, there's lots of gaps in knowledge. So we also have asked all these patients questionnaires. And, and these are patients that are being seen even at leading lipid centers. Yeah. And, and so we're asking them uh, how, how, how well they understand their disease. So how many of these FH patients have a full understanding of all their available treatment options? Only 34%. How many understand your personal risk for heart disease? Only 60%. How many understand why screening family members is important? Only 71%. So, you know, there's lots of gaps that need to be addressed uh, across the United States. Then the last couple minutes before we get to your questions, I'm just going to talk about one uh, big data project about uh, FH. And that, this is called the Find FH Initiative, and Stanford is a partner with this. And so uh, this is the irony of FH. You know, normally when we're looking for a disease, we're looking for small signals. You know, the needle is small, the haystack is big, it's hard to find the disease. But that really shouldn't be the case for FH. FH is a big needle in a small haystack, and we should be able to find FH patients if we look hard enough. And the irony is that, that we should be able to find that, but we're not finding it. I've told you that only 1% of people in the United States with FH know they have it. And it's hard to do it, again, because there's no specific code for FH. So doctors can't put into the medical record, I have a patient with FH. They can only put in, I have a patient with high cholesterol. And so we're taking a big data approach to try to change that, at least at Stanford and hopefully across the, across the world. So what does big data mean? And it's a, it's a word that's getting, this is a phrase that's getting a lot of, uh, a lot of press lately. But I mean, it can mean volume, variety, velocity, variability, ver veracity. But a, a, another explanation that, that I think is kind of cute is one of, our, one of our scientists said, big data is like teenagers and sex. Everybody talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, and so everyone claims they're doing it too. So, you know, big data is this sexy topic. Everybody says we're doing with things with big data. And, 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 but the most important thing is whether the data is big enough to solve the problem that you're interested in. And so I'll give you uh, another example of how this, this might work. So, what, anybody can tell me what this is a picture of? No, nobody, nobody can tell me what that's a picture of. Now, if I take this slice of the data, anybody tell me what that's a picture of? 
No, nobody knows what this is, this is because this is not the right slice of data. Now, what if I change this slice of data? You know, instead of showing you, this is 5% of the image. What if I show you a different 5%? Anybody know what that is? No, because it's still not the right 5% of the data. But what if I showed you 5% of the data in another way? Now, how many people know what that image is? It's the selfie at the Oscars, the most tweeted photo ever, right? So if you have the right 5% of the data, you can learn a lot. And so that's, what, that's sort of analogous to what we're trying to do. So how, how many know who this person is? OK, so everybody knows who Ellen DeGeneres is. OK, so how do we find the right 5% of the data? And so what, we, we're, what we're trying to do is look across the huge medical records that we now have at Stanford and look and try to find FH patients within, within the electronic medical record. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use some fancy techniques, which are like called machine learning and natural language processing. And natural language processing means using a computer to read text, basically, for the purposes of this lecture. So wouldn't it be nice if you could go, in to a, go to a computer and say, read all the doctor's notes that have ever been at Stanford and pull out all the patients that, where a doctor has said they have familial hypercholesterolemia. That would be kind of amazing. And what is machine learning? Well, machine learning is uh, another fancy thing, but it's not... It, intuitively, it's not that hard to understand. It's software that learns by example. And basically, you give the computer a bunch of examples, and you say, learn what this is. And, and an example of that might be, you know, uh, you go, um, you, so, uh, when, it, when somebody, um, you, you, you buy a bunch of stuff using your credit card for two or three years. And then uh, a few years later, and so the credit, credit card company computer learns what you buy normally. Then if a diamond ring shows up on your, on your credit card that was purchased in uh, Brazil, then you get a call from the credit card company saying, this looks anomalous. This does not look like the patterns that you normally have. And I'm, this is an automated voice message from your credit card company. Did you actually make this call? And so credit card companies use machine learning. You show that at a bunch of examples to do credit card fraud. You know, uh, if you, any of you have Netflix accounts or Amazon accounts, they learn what your preferences are just by you purchasing things, and then, it, and, it, and then it feeds you examples of what you like. The U.S. Postal Service also uses machine learning. You know, There's not a person that looks at your envelope that says, I want to send this to Sue Smith at, at, at uh, you know, zip code 27514. The, uh, the, the, machine, the machines read those envelopes now, and they read the envelopes by being shown thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of handwriting so they know what, 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 what things mean. So we're going to do the same thing in the, in the uh, electronic medical record. We're going to take the 100 FH patients that we follow. We're going to show the entire medical record of these patients to a computer, and we're going to say, show me, learn what these patients look like, learn what the patterns of these patients are through the medical record, and then once you learn that, show me all the other patients that are in the medical record that look like that. Uh, I hope people are following me so far. So, and then we're going to look at the demographics, their medical history, their family history. We're going to look at structured and unstructured data. That's, structured data is things like lab results or, or um, blood pressure or numbers. Unstructured data is things like text or things that's not put in a spreadsheet. And so we're going to take these known FH patients and we're going to say, we're going to look in clinic notes, we're going to look in lab results, pharmacy claims, you know, prescriptions, procedures that they've had. And we're going to say, what is common for FH patients among this? And then show me all the other examples of that. And so we've got some, um, some we're just starting this project now. And so maybe in a year or two, I'll come back and show you what the, um, show the, show you what the results are. So uh, that's really the end of what I wanted to say. And the most important thing is for FH, the time is now. And uh, I gave you a pre-talk quiz. So now I'm going to give you a post-talk quiz. How common is FH in the general population? Who says one in 1,000? Who says one in 500? Who says one in 250? 200. Come on, people got to raise your hands. This is... Okay, it's not one in 1,000, so I, fail, I failed on that. It's, it's somewhere between one in 200 and one in 500. Okay. FH patients are at what fold in 20? Right. Cascade screening. Cascade screening is family tracing. It's screening all the relatives of a family member that has FH. What is the goal LDL cholesterol? How low do I want it to be? Yes, 100. Yes, at least 100. 
And mutations in what three genes cause FH? LDL receptor, we know that one. PCSK9, we know that one. So it's got to be this, right? Because this is the only one that PCSK9. Now, you know more. I'm going to show you how, how well you did. So in September 2013, uh, 500 cardiologists were, uh, were uh, surveyed about what they understood about FH. 80% were unaware of the prevalence. 70% did not recognize it when given an example. 60% did not realize that it was autosomal dominant. And none realized that they were at 20-fold increased risk of heart attack. So already you know more than 80% of the cardiologists in the, in the country about FH. So that's all I had to say, and I'm um, happy to take questions about that or uh, other topics. So you said at the beginning that it is very difficult to diagnose and find the, the patients when they're very young that have high cholesterol. But when people start having like uh, physicals, they always check the cholesterol if it's so abnormally But it turns out they don't. So in the United States, the, the pediatric guidelines recommend all kids have their cholesterol checked between ages 8 and 11, and that's almost never done. So we're missing a huge opportunity to find those kids because people don't adhere to the guidelines. But that should be an easy fix. <coughs> well, <laughs> it, it, you know, it should be an easy fix, but, you know, uh, convince a parent or a physician that they need to draw blood from an 8-year-old, it's not, you know, and, and uh, it's not that easy. So. How difficult is it to develop a, a FCA9 code? Uh, ICD-10? Yeah, it's not easy. So to get a, a code, you actually have to make an application to the Center for Medicaid Services. So you, you call these physicians and you, you make a petition, and people are making petitions all the time, and then you have to go and, and explain to you why the, you think this is important. And so we, a few years ago, went to Baltimore and, and represented, and we think that it will get approved. But as you know, ICD-10 codes were supposed to be implemented in the U.S. last year, and they've been put off. They keep getting put off because... It's it's going to cost healthcare systems money to implement them. So ultimately, ultimately it system. will go. We think, yeah. Are there consequences for kids being on statins for decades? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and that's one of the reasons that pediatricians don't measure it because they say, well, what do, what do I do, what do I do about it if I find it? I'm not going to put the kids on medications, and so we know statins have been around since the the mid '80s, so we don't know consequences for 60 years because we only have 35 years worth of data. But so far, the major, for patients like F, for, for FH kids, the major side effect that we can find is that they just don't develop vascular disease. So they develop normal, normal, normal sexual maturity. They have normal muscle strength. They have normal exercise tolerance. They uh, have normal mentation. So we can't find any major side effects do we know about 60 years? No. Um, we, ha we don't know whether it prevents heart attacks, obviously, because these kids are not old enough to have had heart attacks yet. But we're presuming that if their vasculature looks a lot better, that it will prevent heart attacks. But it's not, not, those kind of studies are extremely difficult. You'd have to study thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of kids that were put on statins and followed them for 60 years, and nobody can afford those kind of studies. If each patient, do they need, in addition to the medication, do they need, like, a, a follow a good diet? Absolutely, yeah. They have to, like, a diet that's low in saturated fat and high in fiber is really important. Exercise daily is very important. All the same things that we would tell everybody, we would tell the FH patients, too. So how about eating foods with cholesterol? Not, it's okay, like eggs? Yeah. yeah, so that's also something somewhat controversial. Yeah, so the question is, what about foods that have cholesterol in them, like eggs. And there's been some press about that recently because the American Heart Association changed their recommendations. And it turns out, uh, after years of study, we've been able to determine that cholesterol that you eat in foods like eggs doesn't turn into cholesterol in your bloodstream. What turns into cholesterol in your bloodstream is saturated fat that you eat. And so if you... If you want to have lower cholesterol levels in your blood, the most important thing is to eat a diet that's low in saturated fat. That's animal fat and uh, in general. 
and and so occasionally, and so the F, the, the AHA has really backed, and, the, and these dietary guidelines have become less strict about things like eggs, uh, which is appropriate, or or shellfish, which is I think is appropriate too. You know, they are talking about butter also was okay. You know? yeah, yeah, a little bit of butter. Well, butter is saturated fat, so I mean, a, a little. You know, the the advice your grandmother gave you about most of this stuff which is everything in moderation is probably the best information. Are there certain populations that are at higher risk for FH in the same way that metabolic syndrome tends to yeah. in populations? So, um, yeah, so there are what we call in, gen in the genetics field founder effects. And what that means is that in, in a, it, if you happen to have a small population at one time in which a few people had FH and that population then expanded, there's a lot of people in that population that are going to get FH just because the number of people that founded that population was small to begin with. And there are founder populations for FH. So, for instance, in the general population, we think about 1 in 200 to 1 in 500 have FH. But Ashkenazi Jews is more like 1 in 100. If you happen to live in South Africa and be a Dutch Afrikaner, it's more like 1 in 80. If you're a Christian uh, from Lebanon, it's more like 1 in 150, you know, so... Uh, there are certain, the Amish, it turns out, probably have the highest population. The Amish in Pennsylvania have extremely high uh, prevalence of, of FH. Is that due primarily to? Because they, they breeding, well, it's, it's not, well, it's, it's, it's just a small community that was founded by a small number of people. And in that small number of people, there happened to be a few, these are, you know, Huguenots that came over. And uh, there's a few Huguenots that had ApoB mutations. So there, there's a very high prevalence of FH in, in, in the. Amish population. If these new drugs are approved, which you're hoping that they will be, <coughs> some sort of fast track, will they um, always be injectable in an injectable? No, there's the, 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 there's three companies that have uh, these PCSK9 inhibitors. One, two uh, are very close to they'll get approved this summer. Those are injectable. The third is also injectable, and then there's a few other companies that are trying to develop pills. Um, but they're very expensive medications, and the way that they currently work is there's any they're antibodies, and so you can't take an antibody by mouth; it will get degraded in the stomach. And so, um, no, not clear whether that's going to happen or not. They're going to be very expensive, you know, ten thousand dollars a year, and so they're only going to be used in the most sort of severe, severe cases, hopefully. Are there any um, is there any research going on for tissue engineering stem cells to override? Well, yeah. Were, well, so the, the you know actually there there was there any engineering tissue engineering that's going on stem cells and uh, it it turns out that that's probably not going to be necessary because the drugs that we have are so effective we don't need to use genetic engineering to correct this. Now there is one form of genetic engineering that you you probably haven't thought of, but in homozygous patients, that is, they get a bad copy of the gene from mom and a bad copy of the gene from dad, their cholesterol levels are ten times normal, five hundred or a thousand milligrams per deciliter, and there their livers just don't work at all. And so the the uh, the gene therapy that's used rarely for those kids now is liver transplantation, because if you take a normal liver and you substitute it, then then everything's back to normal. But uh, but that is very rare, and and you know because the things the medications that we have are fairly effective. What's the contribution of the Physical exercise I don't know, I to cure the FHB. It, 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 it helps modestly. You know, uh, we think that diet and exercise can lower your LDL cholesterol by, on average, about 15%. And for FH patients, if you need a 60% reduction, it's only part of the equation. You know, for a normal person, that might be very, very effective. But for FH, it's a fallacy for those patients to think they can get away with just diet and exercise. They did. It's not their fault. You know, you just can't exercise your way to low enough cholesterol. So you had mentioned earlier that um, they're thinking HDLs, you know, it used to always be like your total cholesterol, LDL, yeah. HDL, and then ratios. Um, so the, now this HDLs are playing a lesser part. In so it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So um, HDL is clearly associated with a decreased risk of heart disease. If you have high HDL, you have a decreased risk of heart disease. And that, that reflects the fact that you're eating a nice diet and you're exercising and maybe you're a woman who hasn't gone through menopause. What I was speaking to, rather, was the fact that 
we have never been able to find a drug that raises HDL levels that results in protection. And, prob and probably that's because HDL is not causally associated with a decreased risk of heart disease. It just reflects an overall better lifestyle. So it represents lifestyle rather more than, than genetics. R yeah, rather than a target for therapies so far as we understand it. So, you know, we don't give FH patients medications to raise their HDL because it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, they hear sometimes some of the athletic people, they, they suddenly they got heart attack, they yeah. die. Is it possible they may have FH? Yeah, so, yeah, so I, actually the other people I take care of are people like that, uh, people with other inherited forms of heart disease. And if you look broadly at athletes who die, suddenly there's about five or six things that happen. FH is pretty rare for that. More commonly, they have actual diseases of the heart muscle, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the heart muscle is very, very thick, or they have diseases of the electrical system of the heart, so they get arrhythmias, things like long QT syndrome, obrigada syndrome, rather than, than FH. So you might have mentioned it, but do you look at the, is the general thing you look at then is just total cholesterol, or do you look at it? Yeah, total, total cholesterol, cholesterol or mostly we treat LDL cholesterol for FH. FH is really a disease of LDL cholesterol metabolism, and so the most important number to know for FH patients is their LDL. Okay. Yeah. And what type, what type of cholesterol numbers are you usually seeing in these FH patients? Total yeah. cholesterol. Well, so you mean what kind of total cholesterol numbers? Yeah. yeah, so in general, a total cholesterol over 300 is very, very suspicious for FH. Total cholesterol of 300, LDL cholesterol of 200. Those are the ballpark numbers that you'd think about. So, very high. Is the web page for your um, nonprofit? Yeah. Does it um, receive funding based on clips on it? Um, not yet. I wish it did. Not yet. It, okay. I wish it, but indirectly it does because. The FH Foundation raises money from all kinds of sponsors, and the more we can show their clicks, the more the sponsors are interested so in sponsoring nice us. If you like it on Facebook yeah, absolutely. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've been yeah. Here tonight and you'd like yeah. that, then you can go to Facebook and like it. And right, share absolutely. It with your friends. We would love for you to do that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think this is probably the end of it, but Dr. Knowles, thank you for a really informative and wonderful talk. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.